Um, Wolf has shared there's been a, a, a terrific series by Health Systems Global and C, and been a series of webinars. Um, really recommend you. They go more in depth on to specific topics. Um, they have all in all four or five webinars. You can access um, the slides. So if you're part of the original webinar, that's a really valuable resource. Also, other resources, um, we are going to pull them together and put them on the ECAMBA site um, on specific topics. So let me just quickly run through this. Let me hold on. Make sure. Does everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So the credit for this um, PowerPoint really comes to Julia King and Paul Pronick. Uh, they used to be based in South Africa and did a very successful series of studies around HIV and microcredit. Um, found this PowerPoint, Julia, I used to, I worked with Julia in a later um, phase of her career, but I found this PowerPoint helpful. So we thought we would run through this to create a common basis and then open it up for questions. They go through a couple of things on, on um, advice on how, how to think about writing for journal publications and what lies behind that and various tips around it. Some will be very familiar to you, some will be new things, and I'm sure those with more experience will actually have a lot more to add um, beyond this presentation. So um, things they um, suggest is that it's, it's hard to have a structure. Um, the first point is don't be intimidated. I think it, it, there's intimidation, but um, Tati here had that um, skills building session also suggested um, that there's a lot of fear when it comes to writing. And certainly in my case, I tend to do everything else but focus, make time for writing. And so I think it's finding time, making time, and actually facing it head on rather than um, doing emails or all the other things that you're, you also should be doing. But it's helpful to have a structure. And journal articles have a structure in itself with sec section having a purpose. And understanding that purpose is helpful. And we're going into that. For me, it's really helpful having a word count and looking up ahead of time, knowing we're going to go into that. Know which journal you're going to target and knowing the word count. Now, open access, like for instance, PLOS, some open access journals don't have word counts. I don't, I, I, for some, particularly to write qualitative articles, find relief. But it can, it's helpful to have a word count because <laughs> it helps you, you know, focus what you're writing. And I think it's tempting to have really long articles, but either you're more likely to lose your reader. So it's helpful sometimes to have a rough word count in in, in. a lot of your epidemiological um, journals are actually um, WHO bulletin for instance is only three thousand words. So a journal output is quite a focused output compared to some of the original writing you do for your PhD. Um, sometimes there's a process of you've done your draft to actually focus it further. Some science journals like social science and medicine and health policy and planning do have larger word counts, but still have a word count. So you need to have that, that um, tree up there right from the beginning. And on an outline so that you know where you're going rather than writing. So planning is really critical. We are. Uh, so as I mentioned, knowing your target journal um, and there's the list you can look around. What is known your topic, and see where others who are on your topic have published. 
um, and know what your audience is. There might be some parts where um, some of your findings that are more straightforward public health programmatic things, you want to target for something like PMC public health or a straightforward public health journal. There might be some pieces that are more theoretical, um, you know, that are, are that for social science and medicine, or some that are very methodological. There are some journals that focus on methodology, like MC Harps or qualitative health research, implementation science. There are journals that really focus on methodology. So know from the beginning what you want to focus on really helps target which journal and knowing the boundaries of that. We uh, draft an article. In your PhD, it's one chapter amongst a larger endeavor. Uh, but really, for the journal article, it needs to stand alone by itself. Um, and you need to write as if the person doesn't know anything about the topic. You're, you're aiming for a lay reader. You should avoid jargon, spell out acronyms. There's a tendency for all of us in our field to create acronyms. And I had a helpful editor who kept on taking all the acronyms. Um, because you want people to understand if they're not common acronyms, people won't remember and you will confuse your reader. And your point is to communicate. It's have an outline, even if your outline changes. Um, to have that as a guiding point as you write. It helps in terms of knowing your topic and how you're going to aim, apart from which journal you're going to aim for, is a sense of um, where your findings fit in your field. And part of that is reading. Um, so the literature review, um, you obviously need to do a literature review as part of your PhD. But that gives a sense also for the journal what you need to cover um, for your topic. Um, it'll give you a sense of how to frame your research findings, figure out what, what's new that you're adding. Do you build on previous findings? Um, are you adding findings, complementing findings that were found in other contexts to new contexts, to new leaders of health workers? Um, are in controversies. Maybe your findings actually go against the grain. And it's only by reading that you get a sense of how your findings fit to the larger body of work. So, um, I think having third, you can read UN reports as well. I think feeling very comfortable with a search, certain search engine. They use PubMed. I also, just out of habit, have always use public, others use other search engines, um, those have access to scopus. That's also uh, um, search engine. And just saying that roughly, this is, um, they're saying more or less 30 articles for a peer reviewed for an article. Um, you have to use your judgment. Obviously, the more you cite, the more, you know, um, um, I think we'll have a session later on how you do a literature review, what you should focus on. Keeping is not to cover everything in your field, but is it meaningful for reader to understand your findings? That's a critical thing. Some things will be less relevant than others. Focus on things that are more current. Um, but I mean repeating everything what everyone has written. You have to do putting the background to your topic. And you can say some things are not relevant because it's a different context. You need to do that interpretation. So the curating process of which references are relevant and which are not. Do you want to come in, Freddie? Yes, um, I, I, have, I have a way of doing that. I have a way that helps me a lot. So what I do is that I, I put what I'm doing, my literature review, as story, and that my findings should be a conclusion to that story that I'm trying to tell. So they flows, and they see that my conclusion or my findings of my study be the end of that story. So that is what helps me to know what to include in the literature and what to exclude. When it was not the sequence. I'm going, I really like it. But if it's that.
that information fixed in the cell I'm about to tell, then it doesn't fit in the story, I think it out. Then my finding now should be a conclusion of that whole story that I've Okay, so she hasn't heard heard very well. Um, what what was saying, can you hear me now, Selakshna? Okay. Maybe if those in the room will have people step up to the mic. Um, what Ferdy was saying, a good way of handling the literature review is thinking of what is the story you want to tell um, and having that shape he was very eloquent, so I think we we um, we just have to bring Mike up closer. And did you come in and just repeat what you were going to say? Yeah. And so I was saying that um, uh, the way um, I judge if an information is relevant to the paper I am writing to ensure that, that what I want to include should be part of the story that I'm about to tell. So first, I said to Mark, out what is this paper about and what is it that I want to communicate at the end? What are my findings saying? And then based on what, so I, if I have the conclusion before I go at the beginning, and then what do I need to put in place for that my conclusion to fit in exactly I want it? That process now helps me to judge what information is relevant to conclusion and what is not relevant. That is how I judge which information I should look for and also judges now my search strategy and the um, key terms that I use for the papers. Because I have a story I want to tell and I want to end like that. So that helps me to select um, the information that I need. Very helpful. Thank you, um, Ferdy. I don't know anyone else um, wants to come in here on the comments on, on Something key references or, or um, their experiences of looking for literature for their um, research articles. Can I? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there were two things. I think uh, we could also add that, you know, I mean, even the uh, country level journals, wherever we are and whichever country are sort of been doing research in. So some of the journals in, the, uh, you know, the well-known journals in those countries, um, uh, we, we should be searching and some of them may not be on PubMed, etc. So one has to see that. Yeah. So be, sure. So being conscious of a lot of us, uh, um, focused on public health, but we also have our findings are relevant to other disciplines, and therefore there are some journals that are not on public health, PubMed. Yeah, conscious I, was, yeah. I, I was talking about the country uh, where the research is from, and there are journals that are published in that country. Like, for example, I look at some of the Indian journals, and some of them may not be on PubMed, uh, so just... Thank you. So regional, there's national as well as regional journals as well. So that comes back to knowing who your audience is, and there might be certain findings that add that are part of a regional discussion or national discussion that you would frame in a different way. Anyone else want to add anything before we keep going? We will just keep going, and I was trying to uh, share desktop in a way so that I can see all the participants, um, but we will figure that out later. Um, so we keep going. So this is just, um, they have just a screenshot. Everyone knows what PubMed or whichever uh, search engine you use. Um, everyone has their own tips of managing um, um, references. Um, I do have a um, and I, um, to have. I found um, sometimes 
um, reference measures save the whole time of the article. Um, later, in doing backups of my files on my computer, they don't save because the title is too long. Um, so I, um, everyone develops their own system, but having a short system where you have the author, a short version of the title, an acronym for the journal and the year, and joining to do that systematically helps you later sometimes finding things. Um, these are just their tips. Everybody has their own tips on how to handle literature. Um, it's and helpful, we'll maybe have a session later on using different reference managers. They use EndNote, but you need to have that um, software. There are now more, more open source, um, the Otero, Delay, there are different open source um, reference managers that you can use. Um, it's always helpful to write notes on what are the, even though it takes time, and I, I'm not always good at doing this, but down notes of what you got from the article, apart from reading it, and keeping that um, in place. Their, their suggestion is if you take good notes, you only have to read an article once. But I always read things more than once. <laughs> because, <laughs> because the relevance of something doesn't... Um, some things that I don't think are very important, and then I learn more. And then I'm back and I realize, oh, this was really a very important, your viewpoint changes over time. And I learn about a subject, you learn to read more critically. So although they are saying to be efficient, you read an article only once. And I suppose as you get more experience, you're able to do that. But I find um, um, to make notes and to be diligent in that way, but I find I go back and reread things. Um, if anyone else wants to share any experience on this, I wonder if I go back to here participants. Keep your hand. There were a lot of people. If you want to add anything to this, um, you read articles. There were a lot of nods in the room. Um, okay, then maybe I'll just keep going. Walden, do you want to add something? We'll just add something and then we'll go. Just quickly on uh, the issues we just uh, talked about earlier about uh, how to limit yourself when you're writing the literature review, which I'm very, very uh, challenging. And probably the case, depending on the kind of topic we're working on. I work on uh, the issue of capacity development, and I find that the topic take me to different places about, you know, people, institutions, and also macro issues. And, and the uh, that always when uh, trying to uh, define the scope of the literature, think about uh, to understand that helps people understand the rest of your paper. I think that's very useful. But usually, uh, I think my engagement with the literature very uh, limited because I, if I go on following the different uh, routes, I often end up with, with lengthy chapters or, or reports, and probably need only one page of that to 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 make up uh, a paper. So that's that's quite a challenge uh, and probably a, a very active process. Uh, also uh, makes us, I think, a bit um, answered to what extent we are able to, to accomplish that. And in terms of organizing my references, I, used, I started uh, without uh, any softwares, and I find it, it you know, uh, results in all kinds of problems. You don't know where your resources are. It's hunting for that one. Uh, you know, interesting report that you read somewhere, and it's a struggle. And, and gradually, I started using Mendeley, and uh, I'm not doing it in a. I don't think I'm doing it in a very systematic way, but still, I find it very helpful in terms of locating resources, uh, also citing 
resources uh, very much. And your question about literature, we talked a lot about uh, published reports and journal articles. But some areas you find that the great literature is quite a helpful resource. And, and, and what is our take on, on using uh, those kinds of resources? Thank you. I have a question, and I think even uh, um, uh, there's guidance on how you look for great literature. Um, but for some of our topics, there might not be there may be more information. Certainly, when you're um, there's a lot of work done by NGOs uh, that are for particularly for new topics linked to I find social justice issues. People's priorities are not to publish peer-reviewed articles. So you need to look at materials to understand certain topics beyond the peer-reviewed literature. Um, great literature. Yeah. I mean, great literature. Um, uh, great literature. Is that when you um, type in your keywords in Google, first you more of um, um, article related um, uh, so, so then the further you go start getting NGO things so, so some I don't know how the engine works but um, the later pages so I should keep going further and further that's when you start getting um, uh, ambition from other sources that are not um, journal articles but the first few pages will be journal articles related then yes you can. so I try to do a thorough search I go up to 10 pages and further then yeah, you get, get a little bit of greatest But I, where there hasn't been good guidance on yeah. on how you search, um, like um, Ferdy said, do you ten pages? Um, um, but for certain topics, it's it's very important um, yeah. because some topics will not be well represented in in the published literature. Absolutely. I should also uh, of um, doing a topic that is more interdisciplinary. How do you weave um, content from different disciplines? Maybe doing a literature would be more challenging um, because you're from disciplines that have different um, ways of seeing a topic, different ways of viewing evidence, and you'll have to do different types of searches to capture that as well. Um, I miss no hands raised from those who are online, so we'll just go through. I have a few screenshots just on how to be systematic in. Uh, uh, what if I can just. Okay, this is a screenshot they did of their, like, their documents library. And they have, if it's by author, all the authors, everything by Jennifer Bryce is all listed together. Just three, four words on the title, the and then the last. And you have your reference manager. When I um, in my PhD endnote, I would save the PDFs in my reference manager, and then when there was an upgrade to endnote, I lost it. So it's good to have maybe two ways of doing this, and not put everything in your reference manager. And also put your notes in your reference manager. Um, Maybe it happens less with the open software versions of it. Um, so in terms of the reference manager, most of them have now um, uh, uh, online version. Mm. So if you lose this, and you, then, back you have a backup online. online, because when you go and download the software somewhere else, all those things will now be, now be downloaded. Yeah. So that will trade it. And continue. Yeah. These set of slides will be outdated. This is an old generation of researchers. Yeah. <laughs> and I personally find the world of synchronizing and passwords a nightmare. <laughs> but that shows my age. <laughs> so there is a screenshot of their endnote. But all of this says, now in the world of open software, Zotero and Mendeley, even EndNote has an online syncing version as well. So slides need to be updated. And they screenshot of just how they wrote um, notes 
separate article, just three bullet points on what the, the main for each section, the methods, the results, what the key purpose of each article was in terms of developing a practice of writing key, key notes for each article. So you can go back in a sense and figure out if you need to go back what it was a quick memory of that article was about. Slide on knowing your target journals. I think we went over this. It'll tell you how much theory you need to include, um, perhaps in terms of spells. Um, what it is to have a few examples from that journal downloaded to look at. Also, you get a sense of what's been accepted before. But I'll use a word like as well, and that will guide you. Factor is important, but for me, I think the most important thing is figuring out how to get your work out um, and um, getting people, having people find your material is important. And um, there are many, I'm, this can come in later on how you can aim high and then if you get to go to another journal, uh, but it's also time. And so I think sometimes just knowing where you aim. Uh, is important because you can it's a long process. <laughs> so then they have a few points on everybody has a different way of creating an outline. Um, I think what's helpful, helpful in my writing is for me to remember that each paragraph should have a um, main, what yeah, thing. If my paragraph has too many points, it's no longer one paragraph. <laughs> the big sentence of that paragraph, it should sort of give an introduction to what you're saying. There should be the meat of what that paragraph says and a concluding so what. But if there are too many points in there, then it's more than one paragraph. And in that sense, it helps me at, through my writing process. Uh, what is the story in the outline you should be able to fill out? What's the story you're trying to tell in that particular article? We'll go with introduction, background, methods, results, discussion, because that is understanding that structure really helps you, guiding you as in public health. So this is something new that I realized is that they said um, choosing a title. Um, and people can disagree on this. Um, tab abstracts are important. You sh usually revisit it at the end. This is I got very late, but when editors tend to read the title and abstract and decide whether they send it out to peer review or not, they necessarily, some eyes are opening, they don't necessarily read your, your whole draft before deciding. Having a good title and abstract is critical because decisions are made on the basis of that. Um, it's something I find I come back to at the end of writing. Um, suggest that you want to, the title should describe what you're doing, therefore, your methods and location. Um, I think less now, but in, in the systematic reviews I've done, it's striking sometimes some Papers, you don't know what country they come from, from the title and abstract. Uh, that's not a good um, abstract. You should know from the title uh, what the topic is. Is it a literature review, a realist evaluation, a qualitative study, um, a, a, a certain type of quantitative analysis, and where it's coming from? Paper in which I put the quotes of one of my respondents as the title. Um, and I think quantitative material lends itself to that. Um, but they, they're suggesting more straightforward titles. But you want to make people interested in what you're writing. So it's worth coming up with some time later on coming up with a title because people have titles. What would motivate them to open your article than others? So it needs to communicate the basics, but it should um, rep interesting about your article. 
thing. I don't see any hands up at this point. But the next couple of slides just break down what each section is about. So your introduction and background. You'd really be able to um, provide, uh, let the reader know the context of what you're trying to address. So it's the stage. For example, they have an example here on child mortality in Africa. Um, what are the issues? What begins to tell the story, as Ferdy said? So he put the example of, of the text of high child mortality. What are the um, causes of that, the interventions, what that? And that begins to tell you what this paper will do. So your should begin to sort of say what the main issues, frame what the main issues are, but identify the gaps and therefore say how your paper, paper will address those gaps. So at the end of that background section, you have a clear aim of what paper is trying to do. The gap will, what will, how your paper answers those gaps and put aims. And I also put at the end of my background section a brief like line of the rest of the paper, also guide the reader. Probably this section in your discussion section has all the references. Um, one thing we can discuss later is which references you put in your background and which in your discussion. I just find that challenging. <laughs> okay, your introduction and background. By the end of the paper, it should be clear what the scope is and what you're trying to do. Let's know this until they. Okay, I'm leaning closer to uh, um, the the speaker. Um, great, and type in her comments. So it's um, I didn't know this until they sent this. That actually, um, this is a critical section in terms of. I mean, it makes sense. We're doing research, so your should be current and transparent. Um, depend type of journal. Sometimes I uh, have a few paragraphs on context. Um, some of the existing work sh I find should actually go in your background um, or um, in your discussion. But this is you would say what your study design is, um, how were the instruments, how you collected data, um, participants, the analysis. Some of you have um, a table of the types of analysis you've done. This really depends on the methodology of your article. And the pre-existing work you're referring to, the work you all added. Yeah, I find, for me, it's usually in your background rather than in, in your, I think it depends on the journal. It's good to check the journal you're targeting. I have written the method section. Sometimes there's a paragraph, for instance, in Tanzania, this particular region in Tanzania, um, what demographic context of that particular region? There's this, this uh, ge ge context is usually geographical context. And the existing work can be like a pilot. It, previous work done by that study. Sometimes. A lot of work with larger studies, so just to reference that. I think it's not referring to the other studies done, because that would be in the background section. Um, pretty, uh, in our um, work, in our uh, reflection in the skill building, a lot of people said they start with the methods section, because the most straight, it's what, the, what is fresh and most straightforward. Um, so though you have the outline, just to get writing that section. And then the IRB of approval. Okay, keep going. I don't have a sense of time, and I want there to be time for question and answers later. Um, results. So I thought this was shocking when Julia and Paul said some people don't re read the results, <laughs> but where we spend a lot of time. Um, and it's key to understand what are the key findings. I find, um, you know, we do PhD research, we do go very in depth, and it's hard to 
to sort of separate, separate out all the things you want to say. And I think having a good outline that focuses what's the key findings you want to share. Uh, they really, they're suggesting you should only have three good tables. Um, in what you want to share, share um, and um, give a sense of, of want to, what's your story that you want to convey. Um, a lot of times put a table and then spend their time writing what's in the table line by line. I would recommend if you have the table, what are the analytical risks coming from that, that table? From saying everything in the table, in which the text should be complementary to the table. Um, we findings from that table. Um, interpret results more later, but that's how I find the balance between a table and um, your net. Um, your, the heads of your table are important. They're able to stand alone. Sometimes your figures and tables get cited separately from the paper. Um, so it's important to have a good heading for those things. Uh, give some examples of like the indicators um, um, that they look at and how they develop certain indicators. That's one example of the type of app. Even if you don't show what the it was a, a table that showed the type of analysis the indicators they developed. Uh, this other table of the baseline characteristics. For some publications, your first table is, is a table of the respondents. Your baseline characteristics it depends on the type of article you're writing. Uh, for some people, this is your first table. Um, that begin to tell your stories. People of, of quantitative outcomes. Um, one suggestion they have that comes later is the quite challenging in qualitative research is how much of the quotes do you include in your in your results section? And they um, one is you can create a text box. At certain sometimes you don't embed it in your, your um, actual narrative to sometimes think of creating a table um, to put some of that in there. It's balance. You'll have to find with qualitative research. So section. This is something that really a lot of people struggle with, and we have a, an article that gives guidance on this specifically that we articulate. First paragraph is the most important paragraph in 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 your in your paper. Um, the first paragraph in your discussion section. Usually, not everyone does it this way, but summarizes your key findings. So that after reading your title and abstract, next paragraph is this paragraph. Uh, I write journal articles differently, though, and I have. Um, we have published things where in the discussion section, each paragraph has a finding, and they discuss it. There are different ways of doing this, but there's one way of doing it, um, where you put, um, you summarize the key findings in that first paragraph. What you want to do is then um, contextualize your findings. How does this compare to what else was done in that context? Then in other contexts, how does this compare? Are you adding to the body of knowledge? Therefore, you're highlighting what, what this adds, what's new. People are ways of writing your strengths and limitations. People put it soon after this first paragraph. Others put it just at the end, before the conclusions. Um, there are different ways of doing that. Um, it's usually one paragraph that summarizes your your study, your the strengths of your study design, as well as some of your limitations. And say how does that change the way you look, look at your study findings? And inclusions are sort of tend to be more general. Um, taking that back, saying how does what, what's the importance of this? Um, 
um, a kind of overview of all the things, um, being clear on your topic and um, where you're going to focus. That lets you um, the journals you're going to focus on, um, getting a sense of um, really reviewing the literature. You should have, that's part of your PhD process. You don't start doing that when you write the article. Um, having a sense of which ones you focus on for this particular chapter and this particular paper. Outline and being clear on what are the key finds you want to present in this journal article. It's not everything that you've learned during your PhD process. It's just for this particular story you want to get, you want to convey. And then revisit the outline as you keep going. Um, there might be that for me the process of writing. I had an outline for my PhD and it would change as I would go going, but it helped me have a structure that I would revisit. So I, um, they have some slides which we might revisit later. Um, and, um, on writing authorship. Uh, it's helpful. You will have your supervisor who reads all your drafts in teams, it's it's helpful to have write with someone else because they see things differently and having a supervisor read um, or other, if you have a writing buddy, uh, having a friend or someone else read what you're writing really helps. Um, I think these slides are more for um, writing teams. There are certain rules on authorship in terms of not just which are the um, positions that matter um, in terms of um, contribution, um, but also there are some GME guidelines on what makes an author, and we circulate those. The PhD, you are always the first author. It's your researched um, endeavor, and you're the one who, who um, are usually coming up with the question. Uh, doing all the analysis, the data, it's really your output. So um, this sense is more for writing in teams. It is uh, determined also in advance. Mm -hmm. It's a collaboration. The first author, as you said, is the PhD student. But depending to what extent people contact something that Mm. So there's a question here on whether you decide authorship in advance or at the end, because people contribute in different ways. So I think it's helpful to do both, um, and depends on how large your team is. So for my, for instance, in my experience, uh, I was part of some very big teams at Hopkins, and we would develop. We would identify. It was impossible for all 15 people to be on every paper. So we decided in advance which papers we were going to write, and we would assign lead authors, and then people would self-select into the writing team. That means that you are a co-author on that paper, but it helps to organize the team and, and assign responsibility. And then I do think then it's a discussion conscious of at the end of the paper to be clear on what the contributions were and who contributed the most. This is often a very difficult conversation. It's not it's not an easy conversation. And they're having this up front um, that this will be discussed and what are the criteria um, to be an author is really important to keep in mind. I just want have any experiences that they want to share based on this? So there's, I don't know if it's here or elsewhere, there's a section on, um, I don't think it's, uh, acknowledgements also, uh, is also a really important part. Uh, all the people who contributed to your study, um, your response, are, you see the acknowledgements in your PhD, it's huge, that's not the same as for what you put in a journal article, but it's still important to be generous and recognize um, everything's gone 
into this. So I, I think we're going to end there, but I'm I'm going to open. Um, I don't know if there are comments that others wanted to share, thinking through these slides or other things linked to write journal articles. Um, I know, uh, but I you produce papers, um, which I think really remarkable. So I don't know if there are particular reflections or up in the room, or Helen, if you'd like to come in with any thoughts. Suluka, Haley, Ida, um, Eleanor has joined. Open to thoughts you may have. Oh, hi. Um, I can't find the hand anymore. <laughs> you hear me? Yes, it's on there. So maybe side you go, and then Helen um um after that oh, sorry i think with the shared screen i just lost the hand let me escape the shared screen yeah might just be my my computer thanks very much asher for that presentation i think it was a way for me to go through it and reflect on some of my uh, on experiences um just a few things that i think that i Sort of that others may benefit from. It's, uh, I think for me, writing articles for my PhD allowed me to at least pull in other people who were not necessarily my supervisors. So where I needed their input and expertise, I was able to do that by pulling in on some of my papers. So. If your supervisors are agreeable to that, you know, that's one thing that's helpful uh, for that. Um, I think the issue uh, for a PhD student is definitely something worth considering. I think you alluded to, to this earlier. Um, Talking about what it takes to get one paper published was for me um, I think something that I had not anticipated in the beginning. Um, with some of the papers, it was clear. With others, it was more year. Um, so I think for a PhD student as well, it, it's important to think about the benefits, but also to think about what it means in terms of the time and the resources um, that you might have. Um, Thing that I had to learn, I think, with peer review was in the beginning to want to respond to everything that the rewards would have said. I think as, as I was getting more experience and reflecting on some of some of the comments, um, I had to learn to be open to the review, but to also be willing to defend my stance where I felt that it made sense, where I felt that what 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 I had a justification for for, for what I had done. I was thinking about the the example that you gave about qualitative work and how you can possibly you know have a table and some codes. I with what my papers I had one reviewer who was completely against that um you know, want that they wanted me to try to um, write in a narrative and have one or two cards. So I think it was a different way of um, of, of looking at things. Um, another um, another issue around selecting journals in experience. Um, um, and one with one paper, what I can recall was I had submitted to to a couple of journals before it could be before it could actually get accepted. But I remember the experience with class one, for example. The on experience was it took months. They just could not find. 
uh, suitable reviewers for that paper. And that was really because PLOS is very quick. I had gone to them because they are usually very quick, but also quite general in that they, you know, take the articles from very different um, uh, um, backgrounds or, or, or topics. So they just could not find, I think, for about four months, they find. Um, for reviewers for what I'd written. So they would then ask me, do you want to withdraw it? And I was hesitant at that point, like, do I withdraw the paper and start with another journal? Do I let them, you know, do, the, do they continue looking? Um, till at some point, I just withdrew the paper and took it elsewhere. Okay. So those were some of the things that I think I experienced, but I not anticipated um, them more. Another thing I think you also alluded to it in the presentation around uh, I think a PhD chapter versus a paper was sometimes I used to have a lot of issues just in one paper. Very difficult because I could end up with like 10,000 with paper and, you know, people can't really digest that. So that was something I had to learn. Um, another benefit for me, I think, was... Um, the papers allowed me to track my progress quite easily. At least I that I could um, I could at least say I've done this and completed and moved to the next section. And that was probably just for me a preference um, and a way of knowing how I operate as an individual. I think uh, a full thesis would have just been way too overwhelming for me. So that's for me a way to track my progress and at least to see, okay, I've made progress, yeah. So those are just my reflections. That's helpful. Thank you for this slide. It's really helpful. I'm going to fill in and then see if anyone online wants to add um, anything to the conversation, just raise their hand and maybe. Um, the point either through the presentation or that but I raised. Let me try and okay. okay, I've got it. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um this presentation is a is a really good overview of how many journals in the public health field would um think about writing a journal article. But I think it's important to recognize that it is one genre writing, and there are others. For example, it's becoming um, meant for people to write commentaries, um, to do fictions on, to tell uh, stories, interviews, and the journals are increasingly encouraging that kind of submission. So it wouldn't necessarily fit a very stereotypical structure such as this. And I, um, I think it's important not to see this as, as the only truth about how one thinks or structures an article. Um, and in certain forms of qualitative research in social science and medicine, for example, may a blurring of self-discussion fiction. Um, so, so that's the one thing, just to bear in mind the different genres and, and the different kinds of writing that are becoming um, more common and acceptable these days. Also, in health policy and systems research, um, a conceptual framing or a conceptual framework is quite common, actually, and in some way in in the methods or the, the introduction, might, might want to think about adding that as a, an in the, in the background of the method um, framework. Um, and just reflecting on you know all of those slides and, and what is the biggest task in a way is is to think of the angle of the paper is what what is right that 
relation to the field. As people have said, you can't PhD work. Um, you have to think about one particular angle. And it's a mistake often I've done it also, is to want to put too much rather than trying to create for your paper. Because you've got lots of data, uh, and the, the, the difference between the monograph you can put data and in a, a PhD by papers. There's a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure where it's coming from. I see. I can see. We haven't tried. Did you mute? Oh, I'm going to put you on mute to see if the echo cuts down. Oh, you are mute. Okay, quiet. Okay. I don't know where they're coming from. Um, what question I have is the problem. So uh, sometimes it helps if everyone who's not speaking just um, mutes their mic. Hey. Okay. Yeah. Look Hold on. Let me see. I can mute people. Is this yeah. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Can anyone online hear me? Yeah. Please. The computer. Which one? To mute. <laughs> okay, we're all learning how to use this technology. Um, one thing I really would like to add something to the discussion. One thing is to reflect on, and it comes from I think there's a lot of pressure in public health to push. Should everything that you find and publishable and you know, there I think for me there was a lot of the way I had it in uh, doing my PhD was it was my journey of things I wanted to learn about some papers that c came out from it but it wasn't everything that was actually that went into the manuscript and I think having that judgment that maybe was worth publishing that if it doesn't get published, doesn't mean that it wasn't of value. Um, and and it can get, write a paper takes a lot of effort. And leaving it for the things that you think will add, rather than falling into the, uh, a, a trap of trying to publish things just for the sake of publishing. Um, because it takes time and energy away from things that uh, really can contribute. And and taking a step back, maybe not everything that we do um, needs to be published. Um, I think that's a trend in public health that's really problematic in the sense that it's crowding out um, a lot of our energies. So having that judgment is critical. So I have Lily and then Selakshana. So Lily first, um, Lily, the floor is yours, and then we'll go to Selakshana. So, um, I just want to add on to ask a question. It's regarding something that Helen said about all kinds of writing, and it's linked with my sort of strong science and medicine background. I have a question about evidence. You know, in, in, in some medicine, there's a hierarchy of evidence being RCTs. Now moving into this new field of public health, what are, what is the, the sort of, you know, of evidence in this field? Uh, myself, especially now moving in from the quantitative um, field or to the 
qualitative methodology. But generally speaking, I want to know when it went to public health, what is your hierarchy of evidence? Thank you. That's like a, a year long course, um, <laughs> but it's a very important question. And I think in HPSR, we've really um, moved. So it really depends on the discipline writing to. So doing an epidemiological study, um, there's a clear hierarchy of evidence. Um, if you're doing clinical medicine, you know, each discipline has its, its um, values and a way of seeing evidence. And I'm being clear, just as you're being clear on what your target journal is, being clear of the disciplines that you're drawing from is critical. And increasingly, for those who are in a health policy and systems world, we're actually arguing that the research questions frame really what type of study design you're following. And that informs what you know what what the guidelines for evidence should be, and it's perfectly um, an exploratory study that is purely qualitative or descriptive can value if that was the research question that you were posed. Um, so I I I have a very agnostic stance because I really think it depends on. At school of Public Health, not everyone is a health systems and policy researcher. So if you're doing a very clinically oriented study or a very epidemiological study, you need to speak to that discipline. But are doing other types of research and therefore will draw from the the discipline their, um, the disciplines they draw from. Others want to add to this particular point before going to selection. Who wants to add to this point? Okay. So to selection, does it help answer your question, Julie? Yes, thank you. I need to send some things um, around the hierarchy of, of evidence and some things that have been published. Um, it really depends on the topic and the disciplines, and there has been some recent writing on that to help um, uh, researchers, and maybe that's something we can follow up on more in terms of resources. Um, so I'm going to unmute. I'm going to try the system. So raise your hand so that I will unmute you, and that will cut down on the echo. So, Lecha, um, yes. can you share your experiences? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for all the uh, inputs and the discussions. Um, I'm really glad I <laughs> uh, planned to join this. Um, so just uh, two things on specifically on the presentation. Uh, we were, I mean, you asked a question on, you know, I mean, uh, there was a discussion on, you know, whether the, in the, I mean, what kind of literature you put in your internal literature review and then in your discussion. So uh, something I remember, uh, I mean, that I've been following from uh, my uh, European PhD days, which I think we were taught then, uh, that, you know, you don't, uh, at least then we thought that, that you don't introduce any new literature and discussion, and you, uh, yeah, you basically go back to the literature review and the background, you know, the kind of the people that you have referred there. But I suppose uh, things have also changed, and and uh, uh, even though I try, I've, I've, in my papers, I've tried to sort of follow that rule in a sense, but like in my current paper, I sort of tried to give it and then introduce some new papers in the discussion. I'm just wondering what the, uh, I mean, what the current uh, uh, yeah, uh, norm or rule is there, uh, you know, on that. So, was one thing. Uh, second uh, thing, uh, uh, the, the discussion we were having on authorship, uh, I think uh, now journals have, uh, have also give quite detailed um, guidelines on, um, you know, how you define the author and, you know, how you sort of assign various uh, roles uh, to various um, authors. So I think that form has been very useful when we have, you know, more than uh, two authors. Um, so, so, so that's been very useful for me. Um, 
Okay, and now, now coming to my experience, I think uh, so. I mean, I'm doing my PhD through uh, through uh, through publications, and for me, you know, that was sort of you know the only way to go because uh, you know, I've been uh, working this issue, I've been advocating on this issue. Just having a thesis would have been. I mean, this was the reason I'm doing my PhD. So you know, so for me, it's really an option to do it. You know, not through thesis. And maybe if I like in India, you don't have the option to do it through publications. And if I maybe had that, uh, if I do it only by thesis. I may not even have taken up the PhD because I think for the time in, you know, it's more relevant for me to have. Uh, you know, papers as part of my PhD rather than thesis and uh, and, and and the experience of I mean, colleagues and friends of actually writing papers after doing a thesis has been very bleak. So, uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to share about that and 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 also uh, and last one year I've been trying to uh, with Helen um, uh, publish one paper and it's I think it's just been 12 months since we sent it to a, a publication. And um, I think, and, and there have been rejections, and we have sent it to more uh, uh, subsequent uh, journals. Um, I think it's very important to be convinced about my paper, our paper, and for that, for instance, when we had some questions from the publications about the, you know, the methodology, about how, you know, we uh, went about uh, you know, uh, analyzing it or presenting it, it was also helpful to ask to other people to just take a look at the paper. And you know, I mean, even though we were also we were convinced with that paper, but also it's, it's useful to you know just send your and uh, um, and if you're convinced about the paper, one should just keep trying. I don't think yeah, um, because there are many determinants of publication and many reasons why you don't publish uh, your work or reject yours. So uh, so one should just keep going. I had written uh, three. Uh, um, in my form, I don't know whether you got them. So, you, in my form, when I was registered, I had uh, written three questions. So if oh, you haven't got them, I... yeah. can you repeat them? We didn't. Uh, we're still u learning how to use this. Uh, uh, so I don't think we've opened the register or received a registration report. I had a list of who registered, but I, he's just looking to see. But you can repeat your question. Yes, it's fine. Um, I think actually the first question was on like I keep getting emails for uh, from a lot of journals, you know, for publishing, and I know that most of them are fraud journals. So question was how to really find out, you know, whether this is a real journal or fraud. But then subsequently I got um, uh, this an email. Morning, and I just managed to download one of the BMC presentations, and and, and they did have a process in that they did they were sort of bring to that, so it's fine. Um, I mean, I don't, uh, yeah. I mean, they talk about how to figure out whether it's a real journal. That sort of thing. Question was so there is this uh, ORCID or thing which builds uh, uh, keep telling us to register. Uh, so I just wanted to, I mean, uh, I, have, uh, I, I do have an ID, ORCID ID, but just want to understand the relevance of it. The third point was that, um, so I, in, in, in one of the reviews, the reviewer came back saying that uh, you should get a native English speaker go through your paper, you know, to see um, yeah, the English. But, um, and, and then I went to the journal's guidelines, and the guidelines, to talk about, you know, native English speaker, you know, yes, uh, that you should get your paper read or corrected or edited by a native English speaker. Now, a native, uh, yeah, um, but I was just wondering whether actually operational, uh, you know, through the review process, whether people from, you know, LMICs, who, I mean, we, we sort of studied English from our childhood, so actually need be a native English speaker. But you know how does that sort of uh, pan out during the review process? Because otherwise, it it, 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 will lead, it will lead to a lot of exclusion of researchers from LMICs, unless you know, and and make a sort of you know, unless they sort of um, meet with some one of some of the you know, uh, nations and uh, you, uh, you know, 
they might uh, i mean they may not get accepted so some because english spoken differently in different places and i think journals uh, need to realize that and accept that otherwise it is very exclusionary uh, so i was just wondering what all your experiences were uh, um, um, yeah all of part of this webinar. yeah thank you much selakshana so you raised a, a whole series of points, and I have definitely some things to share. But let me um, just see if there are others in the room who'd like, or others on the line, if you want to raise your hand, if you want to speak to any of the points that have been raised by Helen Budsai, Haley, uh, or Selakshana. A lot to discuss. Um, anyone? Erica? No? I think there's a, uh, for me, I think there is a lot of racism, even in, uh, and I'm being very strong about it, but, um, um, it, but you just have to develop, I don't know, my strategy is develop a thick skin. I mean, I, I have always, I think um, some it comes from the other peer reviewers. It's not always journal editors. Um, and um, and unfortunately, that is, is part of not just writer journals, um, but I think throughout your research career, you you encounter in different ways um, patients uh, all the time about who you are, um, and you. Um, um, Different strategy, um, but I often find um, always been a point of, of people um, understand what you do, and, and to it can be very frustrating. But to 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 uh, on journal articles only get rejected on the basis of of your writing um, style. Um, people do make assumptions on the basis of your name, name uh, and assume that you're not uh, you are not a native English speaker. Many, as you said, there are many ways of writing English. There are many writing styles as well. So I think um, the key that um, to to be, to have the persistence to stick with it, and and, and even if you have someone copy edit it. Um, what you that's really the basis of um, rejection. If it's an issue where that's the basis of rejection, I, I would assume you'd have grounds um, to on that particularly. Um, to come in here, I have some other points there, but let me um, hand over to Helen as well. So, yeah, can you hear? Yes. Not all journal editors or reviewers are of correct and as selection is said. And, yeah, one can challenge actually um, certain kinds of responses and practices. So, and I think what we did about what we did was to get another opinion. You know, journal, with a journal editor who just completely misunderstood actually what the was about. And, and we actually build it, um, and you can do that. And, and I think the same with with which is, is get someone else just to have a look and, and give their view. What I wanted to just comment on was the whole predatory journal situation, which has really exploded in the last five years or so, and is confronting all of us. And, and there's more and more guidance out there. And for example, at UWC, so for those of us who can um, attend this, there is a seminar, our seminar on the 29th of June at the UWC Library. That's going to, it's an information session with the latest information on predatory journals. Um, at the NRF, the National Research Foundation has apparently released a statement on this. Um, and so, it's getting more and more attention. There was a, a, a site, the Bills 
site on Prairie Journals, which was in fact closed down um, because of the boundaries between what was in and out was quite contested. So it's a very, very real problem. I wondered if there was anyone in the group who would be willing to attend this um, briefing session on the 29th, who can go and then maybe just post something to the PhD ECUMVA site on how, what are ways of, of making judgments? I mean, there was, there's quite guidelines um, about the way the journal presents itself peer review, etc. But sometimes it's not always totally obvious. Um, so I just wanted to suggest that maybe one of us should go there and, and share with the rest what's, what's the latest communication on, on it. You have an excellent suggestion. Um, I, uh, Salakshana, I'll go back to you. You still have your hand up. I, I think this issue, Budzai raised it, of learning to defend your ground. So I think having others read your work is really important so that it doesn't become a personalized back and forth. Um, but it is important to um, figure out um, and, uh, what are the points that are um, core to your article that you don't want to change. And I know one of my PhD articles it can be some people go through in a straightforward place way. I think for those of us who are not, not writing straightforward public health articles, it's harder because um, you are shaping the field. Yeah. Um, and I've had some of my first PhD papers. I the first one to social science and medicine. They had me do a whole bunch of revisions and still did it. He, he still didn't sit out to peer review. His main was I didn't have enough respondents. Uh, I had like 50 uh, interviews and I had a year of participant observation. So, but he was just not quite, you know, qualitatively in tune. I submitted it elsewhere. It, w it went through almost like seven rounds of peer review. Uh, one of my best articles. So it's just learning to stand your ground and sort of saying no, you know. Um, and then there are other, uh, this isn't uncommon. The more I've talked to other people, I've heard people say, one thing's I accepted and some things I really realized people didn't understand what I was saying. And you have to learn to sort of constructively argue. Um, it's helpful. I have a format where I have a ta table for review comments, so that's um, easy to see the response to each uh, comment, um, to very polite, uh, um, and for the things that you don't agree to, to have a rationale for why that against the ground of what you understand uh, or of what your article is trying to convey. Um, unmute Selectiona, because I think you want to come back. Thanks. Actually, initially, uh, yeah, I had forgotten to take my hand down. But then um, I just wanted to, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say that, um, I mean, see, I, mean, I realize that articles need to be grammatically correct and sentences need to be grammatically correct. But it was a shock for me to see on the journal website, you know, that they want to, you know, uh, you know the, 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 that whole sentence, which I, I mean, I, I mean you know, we are, we are also reviewers. We are also parts of part of journals. So I don't. I I just don't. That, you know, very acceptable. Having a native English. I mean, you say it has to be in proper in grammatical English. But you know, come up for a native English speaker. I just not find it. Um, yeah, yeah. Project. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to share that. So, um, Ferdy would like to add something. Yeah, about the predatory um, journals, um, an idea just came to me. You, um, there are some journal selector um, softwares. I um, um, direct me to one called EDANS. I noticed that if you use these softwares, they enlist the predatory journals on the app, on the of, of journal. So, if you put in your abstract or your key 
keyword give you um, uh, possible journals that you can submit your paper to. And these software hardly have the projected journals in this Okay. So that's something Fred had mentioned before, is that yeah. there are um, no... I have a list of journals. Yeah, I just shared the link on the post earlier. Okay, I shared the link on the chat earlier. I can't seem to find my chat. Here it is. Uh, so catching up on all the chats. So Walde, Walde, um, um, the link there. Um, there. This is how the field is advancing. There are. Um, it's that that gives suggestions yeah. journals based on putting in your abstract and title. Um, I um, from your literature review, you should already know exactly. which are uh, um, the journals you want to target. So you can use that software. It might identify some journals that are new. Uh, but definitely go and look up that journal and find out what has been published, who's published their articles before. That wouldn't be your only basis for deciding on that. And had a very good point um, in terms of hierarchies of evidence, distinguishing that from um, the of rigor. So while um, um, these are separate things, um, in certain disciplines there is a hierarchy of evidence. Um, others there aren't, but that doesn't. Each discipline has its sense of what makes for systematic research and what makes for quality research. And that's important to keep in mind throughout. So my notes, there was a lot of shared. I don't know if um, anyone wants to go uh, discuss a little bit more selection I mentioned between background and discussion. So one thing that I find is an easy edit. Uh, um, sometimes people bring new findings in the discussion section. Your discussion section should be a reflection of what you put in the article. You shouldn't be bringing in new findings in your discussion section. Your findings, you know, typically your discussion reflects on what you've written. Uh, I've um, idealized people are so strict today that the references should references that are already listed in the background section um, not face that limitation. I haven't brought in new findings in, in discussion. But I have sometimes cited references that are not in my background section, in, in my discussion section. I don't know if there's one who, Helen or anyone else wants to give an advice on how do we differentiate the references that you have in your background section and then the references um, that are in your discussion section. Um, I think um, one, you know, I think the terrain that speaking to should be different. Um, production and background, and if you had another very specific reference <laughs> terrain, then probably it's okay. I think one should enter into new terrains in the same way one shouldn't introduce results. I think the upfront framing needs to to care what the theoretical content um, it should be that follows, in my view. Um, yeah, broadly speaking, but I think, you know, there may be the odd risk here and there. Um, yeah, you know, I don't think there's a rigid rule. That's my view. Yeah, maybe there are more back in your background. You set the the, the theme. Um, they're all context. And in the discussion, you might want to because you're contextualizing what you found. You might speak to a subset of references 
that are most closely linked to your findings. I don't know, um, Erica, if you have any comments or reflections, Jessica? Yeah, you've joined us from Uganda. Do you want to share anything? I'm just going to go down the list. Um, the floor is yours if you want to ask any questions or share anything. Can you hear me? Okay, hold, hold on. Eric, you're on anything. Is he unmuted? Muted from your side, Eric. So if you want to speak, you need to find the button. On. You don't think he's muted. Oh, up here at the top, even I. Him. At the, um, the panel, Wayne is to the right is a mute is a microphone. So to speak, you need to unmute it on your end. Okay, um, we come back to you if you want to add anything to the conversation. The mute. Oh, is news joined. Come to the conversation, Juanita. I'm going to go from the top of the list down to see if there are any other com um, reflections before we close off for the day. So hold on. So anything else you'd like to share before we close off for today? No. Thank you for making time. I know you're very busy running around working on different things, but um, I hope this is a way we can bring people <coughs> sorry, at different stages of the it's community back together. Thanks. Ella, you're joining us from UCT, I think. Uh, can you hear us? Um, I was just wondering if there's anything you'd like to share. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Okay, some people found it easy to speak, but others, we might have to do a, like a webinar or any session at the beginning. <laughs> oh, there's a chat from... Okay, Eleanor doesn't, she sent us a chat. Um, okay. Uh, has no microphone. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. So we'll work out how to get you a microphone. Thanks very much. Okay. So, Erin, you'd like to add to the discussion before we close? Sorry, I'd be muted because of my cough. Hey, anything you'd like to add? Okay, very quiet. Um, any questions before we close off? Yeah, check how many people have microphones. Kanita, I know you joined very late, but um, uh, we will have, maybe we'll write, we have a recording of the session. We'll work out what's the best way to share <laughs> some of the key things that we've discussed with the group. Um, Thanks for joining us, though. Um, so, any last comments? No, I'm good. Thanks. Good. Any last comments or reflections? I'm fine. Thanks.
So we will send Rhonda a survey. If there are no further reflections, uh, we've managed to just about keep everyone awake, <laughs> even in my room. <laughs> um, I think this is a good start. I want to thank Bianda and Walde for doing the background work for setting up the webinar. Helen Goodsai for um, agreeing to kick us off with reflections and forward to having more of these sessions. So send us your suggestions of specific topics and I'd like to convene all of you more regularly um, for experiences. And maybe we'll send out a survey to just get your gauge your experience to make sure that this um, format works for everyone. Um, touch base every once in a while. So thank you all. Thanks very much for making the time. And tomorrow. Okay.